Thank you, Francis, and thank you, everyone, for coming out on a lovely afternoon. Um, I should introduce my associate, Joe, who is, as I say, helping with visuals. We call this the human easel. Um, anyway, I'm here to talk today about, really, the Williston family and the town of East Hampton. Uh, prior to 1785, East Hampton did not exist, except as a precinct of Northampton. There was a village called Pescomic, kind of out on East Street, and a handful of farms. Pescomic actually belonged to the Northampton Congregational Parish, for in colonial Massachusetts, church and town were interdependent. One could not exist without the other. Southampton, settled in the 1730s, was incorporated as a second precinct of Northampton in 1741. The Southampton Congregational Church was established two years later. The settlement around Pescomic Village was also growing. Residents petitioned for severance from Northampton in 1781. Anticipating the success of their request, they began construction of a meeting house in 1781. However, Southampton parishioners, perhaps fearing the dilution of their small congregation, blocked the petition. It was not until June of 1785 that the town of East Hampton was incorporated. The following November, 46 adults were formally dismissed from the Northampton Church to form the first congregation in East Hampton. Fifteen Southampton families followed, and the congregation was formally organized on November 17th. Initially, the Reverend Aaron Walworth was hired to preach, then a Mr. Hold. Neither was willing to remain as the permanent settled minister. But in 1789, Payson Williston accepted a call to the pulpit. Payson, a native of West Haven, Connecticut, was 26 years old. He's much older in that painting. He was a veteran of the American Revolution, having taken part in the defense of New Haven in 1779. Preaching was practically the family business. Payson came from a large family of clergy, including not only his father, but several uncles and cousins. All of them, Payson included, were products of Yale University, which had, in the decades prior to the Revolution, become the intellectual center of New England's Great Awakening. The Great Awakening had been, in essence, a return to the church's Puritan roots. Payson Williston may have been one of the last of the great Puritans. He was fundamental in his approach to scripture, one for whom heaven and hell were physical realities, his approach to worship emphasized Puritan simplicity. He was also an active evangelist. In 1805, he took a leave of absence from East Hampton to perform missionary work in upstate New York. Late in life, he would, late in life, he would note that he was especially proud of the five revivals he had conducted in East Hampton, in the course of which dozens of individuals had publicly acknowledged Jesus as their savior. He had a reputation as a good speaker, not the liveliest or most inspiring, to be sure, but one who spoke with clarity and sincerity. When the congregation was expected to hear sermons of an hour or more twice every Sunday, that was important. No one has ever suggested that he had a sense of humor. In 1839, six years into his retirement, he returned to the pulpit to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his arrival in East Hampton. After speaking at length about his own and the town's history, he turned his attention to his former flock and said, many sermons you have heard from men who have come to you as messengers from God. And in the course of my long ministry, I've delivered to some of you hundreds and hundreds of them, apparently without any permanently good effect. Services took place in the meeting house on the town common. The common, only a postage stamp sized piece of which remains, actually encompassed all of Upper Main Street from behind the present day Memorial Hall to the traffic light. As the name suggests, it was common land where villagers could meet, conduct business, graze livestock, etc. But East Hampton desired a real church. Payson's Williston, Payson Williston's successor, William Bement, would see it built in 1836. 
But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to 1795. The town was 10 years old. George Washington was president. On June 17th, Samuel Williston was born in the East Hampton Parsonage. That house still stands on Park Street. It is much grander now than it was when Sam arrived, the second of five surviving children. The Reverend Payson Williston's salary was tiny. To feed his growing family, he planted a few acres of mediocre farmland. That farm is now the heart of the Williston Northampton School's magnificent campus. Young Sam grew up with religion and the work ethic all around him. It may have been an austere childhood. It was hardly confining. Payson Williston and Samuel's mother, Sarah, valued learning and ideas. Early on, Samuel assumed he would follow his father's footsteps to Yale and eventually enter the ministry. Admission to Yale, then as now, required an edu education of substance, and that presented a problem since East Hampton had no schools. Sam was taught by his parents and later by the minister in Southampton. And he briefly attended a small academy in Westfield. He attained a decent, if fragmented, education, but it came second to farm work, first at age 10 at home, later at a nearby farm where he was able to earn a few dollars for his family. I don't think you have to hold that up like for 10 minutes at a time. Okay. At 19, he took advantage of an opportunity to attend Phillips Andover Academy, which offered scholarships to the sons of clergymen. At Andover, Samuel lived with a family in the village. To earn his keep, he did chores, chopping wood and so on. His daytime work meant postponing study until after dark. Candles were expensive, so Sam worked by the light of a single whale oil lamp. It produced more glare than useful light. He'd been at Andover for only one term when he became concerned that his eyes were failing. Poor eyesight ran in the family. He consulted doctors who had very little help to offer, and that may actually have been a good thing, considering that the medical practice of the day often did more harm than good. It became apparent, though, that he could not continue his studies, so he returned, disillusioned, to East Hampton. Before long, he was in Springfield, learning the storekeeper's trade with a family friend. Business seemed to suit him. He learned a few things about sales and hard bargaining and managing money. Eventually, he took a job in New York with another family friend, Arthur Tappan, and continued his hands-on business education. That ended suddenly in 1817, when the economy forced Tappan's business to close. Sam returned home, still feeling, at age 22, rather a failure. Not long after this, he met Emily Graves, the daughter of the minister in Williamsburg. Again, she was much younger than the picture at the time. Emily was as serious-minded as Samuel. And Sam's father, no fool about these things, brought them together. But in an age when arranged marriages were common, Samuel and Emily just happened to be ideal for one another. There is, in fact, plenty of circumstantial evidence that they were genuinely in love. They were soon engaged, although the wedding would not take place for another five years. Samuel insisted on achieving some measure of financial security before committing himself to marriage. He scraped together a little, little money to expand the family farm and raise sheep where we now play football. Sam saw possibilities in getting in at the start of a New England wool industry, which could compete with expensive British imports. He had also never, lo never lost his interest in education and found that despite his poor sight, he could teach a little in the winter when the farm needed less attention. In May of 1822, he and Emily were finally married in a simple farmhouse service in Williamsburg. Emily wore a black silk wedding dress, the first silk garment ever worn by any member of her family. They had no honeymoon, but packed a picnic and rode out to Rum Brook at the foot of Mount Tom. Circumstances permitting, they would revisit that spot on their wedding anniversary for the next 52 years. Their wedding was the beginning of a spectacular partnership. Do you have an image of the submissive 19th century housewife? 
not Emily, who was clearly Sam's equal in both intellect and will. And Sam knew it and cherished it. Marriage, they would consult one another on every business or charitable venture. More to the point, to save Samuel's bad eyes, Emily would read to him and frequently wrote for him. She knew everything he did. They would prove to be an ideal combination of a man of ideas and a woman of practical means, not without ideas of her own. One of the great success stories of the 19th century begins with the most mundane, insignificant item imaginable. In an economy based partly on, bar on barter, Emily, like many local women, earn a little extra money or items to trade by doing needlework. Her specialty was making fancy cloth-covered buttons. It was a tricky process in which a circle of cloth was sewn around a wooden disc. She learned this from her mother. In 1823, the Willistons had a visitor. Emily noticed that on his coat there were buttons of a type she'd not seen before. Well, she couldn't resist. While the rest of the household was asleep, she removed a button from the coat, carefully took it apart, figured out how it was made, reassembled it, and sewed it back on. The guest left the next day, unaware of his role in East Hampton history. All right, pause. Those of us who grew up in Williston Academy culture any time between about 1870 and 1970 cut our teeth on this story. It is part of Emily Williston, the legend. One challenge for an historian is to try to separate the good stories from the true ones. Is this one true? Sam Williston used to tell it slightly differently. Joseph Sawyer, who served on the Williston faculty from 1866 to 1919, wrote that he had this version from Emily herself. As one who valued her moral reputation above all else, Emily would not easily have admitted doing something downright sneaky. So in this instance, there appears to be some truth to the tale. But in any case, Emily practiced making the new button until she felt secure with it, and then, remember the black silk wedding dress? She cut it up to make sales samples. Sam took them to a tailor shop in Northampton. Here's another spot where the legend might get in the way of history. The story is that while Samuel was schmoozing with the tailor, Amherst College President Heyman Humphrey came in to order a new suit, saw Emily's buttons, and bought them on the spot. This may well be the beginning of Williston's long and fruitful relationship with Amherst College. Shortly thereafter, Sam sent samples to his former New York employer, Arthur Tappan. Tappan's response was astounding. He offered $50 for 25 gross. That's 3,600 handmade buttons. 50 bucks may not seem like much to us now, but to Sam and Emily, it was a fortune. Consider, the most Sam's father had ever earned in a year was $300, and he was often paid in firewood or chickens. Tappan paid cash. The Willistons worked out a scheme in which local women were employed at home making buttons to the new design. Samuel and Emily provided materials, instructions, and transportation. Soon over a thousand households between Springfield and Pittsfield were employed in button manufacture. And for the first time in their lives, the Willistons were earning real money. It's an early example of the remarkable business team this couple would make. Emily had ideas and the practical sense to figure out how to do something. Samuel was ambitious and could sell. This is Samuel. There we go. His talents lay not only in salesmanship, but in an ability to make unusually canny financial projections. He was a perceptive market economist at a time when the, the term had not yet been invented. He could analyze balance sheets and practically predict the future. As the button business grew, he didn't sit on his cash, but started or invested in other industries a general store, the railroad, gas lighting. He was a founder and first president of the First National Bank of East Hampton. Later, as the savings bank movement began to address workers' need for consumer-level banking, 
He helped found East Hampton Savings Bank, upstairs from the National Bank, in the building that now houses, straighten that up, the, thank you, the building that now houses Fickert and Banus Insurance. He was especially active in the cotton yarn and elastic industries. He and Emily seemed to be especially lucky or especially blessed. But even as they shared success after success, horror struck. For most of us, the loss of a child is unimaginable. Between 1827 and 1833, Emily and Samuel had four daughters. Not one of them lived past the age of five years. At a time when antibiotics were unknown, infant mortality was common. But all their children? With their deeply held religious beliefs, Emily and Samuel would have turned to God and asked, why? What can we do? And for them, God had an answer. Use what has been granted you to do the Lord's work, which they did. If there was a worthy cause, Sam and Emily were there. Foreign missions were important to them. The abolition of slavery. Samuel built a new congregational church for the growing town. When it burned down, he built it again, and a third time after the steeple fell through the roof in a windstorm. The third structure still stands, the East Hampton Congregational Church. Education, they were passionate about education. In 1835, Williston Money and Influence helped Mount Holyoke College get started. During the 1840s, 18 Amherst College was in financial crisis until Sam underwrote their debt. The Amherst trustees actually offered to, name, to rename the college for him. Sam and Emily, like many Americans in the 1840s and 50s, were caught up in the idea that it was the manifest destiny. Remember that phrase from US history? It was the manifest destiny of the United States to expand and develop the, West, the Western continent. The Willistons clearly believing that educational institutions were a hallmark of civilized society, subsidized the founding of several colleges on what was then the frontier, including Knox in Illinois, Grinnell in Iowa, and others. Okay. I, said, I said doing the Lord's work. For many of us in this very secular age, that doesn't ring true. But let's return for a moment to Williston's Calvinist background. Calvinism had deep roots in New England. It was the core of the Puritan faith which had led the first pilgrim exiles to settle in Plymouth and which dominated Massachusetts religion and politics during much of the 17th and 18th centuries. As its American version evolved, New England congregationalism softened its harshest attributes, although not before hanging 18 innocents during the Salem witch hysteria. It was falling out of fashion by the early 19th century, despite the efforts of diehards like Pace and Williston and his son. Calvinism taught that God had a plan for each of us. Your life was determined before you were born. If you were predestined to be a horse thief, so be it. If, however, you were one of the elect, one of those whom God had selected to be saved, then heaven was guaranteed. But, you might ask, what about free will? Was there nothing you could do? How depressing. How fatalistic. No wonder the belief was in decline. Samuel Williston's grandson, I should mention that he and Emily adopted four children and brought them up as their own, his grandson marveled that, and I quote, a man of some education and superior intelligence should be agonized with fear that he was not one of the elect and that, irrespective of his conduct, he was fated to eternal damnation. Yet such was Mr. Williston's attitude of mind during a large part of his life. One prayed to be among the elect, a recipient of God's grace. That grace was justified through faith, a faith demonstrated by the way you led your life. Now, this idea can be interpreted as incredibly arrogant, especially when accompanied by the pose of public piety practiced by the great and would-be great of the time. But this is an oversimplification and an unfair one. For Calvin's message was that success was granted by God, 
that material blessings were gifts meant to be enjoyed and especially shared. Samuel Williston, having started out literally with nothing, was particularly conscious of this obligation. It would drive his actions throughout his life. Early in 1841, the Hampshire Gazette published an exchange of letters between Samuel and his close friend, Professor William Seymour Tyler of Amherst College, proposing something called an English College for the Hampshire County region. It seems clear that they'd been following the efforts of Dr. Thomas Arnold, headmaster of the rugby school in England, to reform British education. During his single term in the late state legislature in 1841, Samuel had also made ed met education reformer Horace Mann and followed his ideas with interest. And of course, he was very mindful of his own inadequate schooling. Williston and Tyler proposed a school for East Hampton that would provide two curricular, a classical department in which young men and women could obtain the traditional grounding in Greek and Latin, which would prepare them for university and perhaps the ministry, and a scientific department in which students who did not plan to go on to college could get a thorough education in engineering, mathematics, surveying, everything needed to, to enter the professions necessary to build the young nation's growing industrial base. This was a radical notion at the time. One can make a case that Williston Seminary was among, among America's first technical high schools. On Samuel's 46th birthday, June 17th, 1841, the cornerstone was laid for the first Williston Seminary building on a campus situated down on Main Street where the banks and Big E's are today. I'm not going to recite the history of the school this afternoon, except to note that in the beginning it was coeducational and open to East Hampton students who had no other high school. Williston Seminary, it was not a religious school despite the misleading name, thrived, although there were some rough decades, particularly after Sam was not around, to pay the bills. And Mr. and Mrs. Williston, they thrive too. In New England, towns like East Hampton were rapidly transforming from an agricultural to a manufacturing base. Williston moved his button business from a thousand kitchens to factories in Haydenville in 1831 and then East Hampton, the town's first, in 1848. That building still stands and houses Landry Furniture. Samuel's grandson recalled a building full of ingenious machines which struck out and covered a button at a single blow. The button mill was the first of many factories Sam would build. Many of those buildings are still with us. It is at least symbolically significant that the Williston Northampton Schoolhouse is a former textile factory. Waves of immigrants were arriving to work in the mills. East Hampton attracted large numbers from Ireland, Germany, Quebec, later Poland. They needed housing, stores, schools, as the Sam and his associates saw to it that they were built. As the town grew, so did the Williston fortune. They were inseparably linked. None, nonetheless, Sam plowed a substantial portion of his income back into East Hampton. Ever interested in education, in 1864, he constructed the town's first public high school what is now known as Memorial Hall. Characteristically, he put it right next door to the seminary where he could keep an eye on it and installed the former preceptress of the sem seminary's ladies department, Sarah Chapin, as its first principal. Miss Chapin would go on to a long and distinguished career in the East Hampton schools. Mean meanwhile, from this point forward, Williston Seminary would become male only as it would remain for the next 106 years. Much else was Sam's, the 1869 Town Hall and Civil War Memorial, for example. Less well known is his generosity to East Hampton's Catholic population. When the Irish immigrants in the mills desired to organize a parish, St. Bridget's, now Immaculate Conception, Sam donated the land. Consider what a leap this was for him, for a man brought up in a brand of Protestantism openly hostile to what he termed popery, to open his arms and his purse to what was in effect the competition. 
Notwithstanding their generosity, the Willistons lived in the grand manner. Their mansion, now the Williston Northampton School homestead, was the finest in town. There are suggestions that Samuel's aging parents, bred to Puritan austerity, did not approve of such vanity. Samuel was criticized for being generous with a dollar and tight with a penny. Inevitably, his, his success, coupled with a certain patrician arrogance, made him a target for fun when he wasn't around to hear it. There are stories, some a little suspect, but too good not to repeat. Sam would drive his carpenters crazy by walking around construction sites, picking up dropped nails. His business partner, Horatio Knight, claimed that one day he and Sam were conversing in front of the mansion. When a passing horse did what horses do, Sam, without breaking off the conversation, produced a shovel and dumped the manure in his garden. Knight also put about the story that Sam's innate conservatism was such that it took serious pressure from Emily to convince him that people might want to purchase buttons in colors other than black. In the business world, Sam was a tough customer. Here's Sam again. While outright dishonesty horrified him, he was a master at taking advantage if he saw an opening. For example, he wanted to import a special fabric made in England to cover buttons. The tariff, an import tax, was very high. Making button covers involved punching holes in the cloth. If the weaver in England could punch a few holes in the cloth, it could be imported as rags. No tariff. During the Civil War, when southern ports were sealed by a Union naval blockade, Sam needed cotton for his mills. He paid a business associate $60,000, a huge sum in the 1860s, to ensure a supply, no questions asked. This meant running the blockade. Since Sam's biggest customer was the Union Army, from which he had a monopoly contract to provide tent cloth and cartridge belts, he wasn't just doing the Lord's work, it was patriotic. And yes, East Hampton manufacturing, like most New England manufacturing, did very, very well during the Civil War. Williston students have occasionally raised the question of whether there was a conflict between Samuel's support for the abolitionist cause and his having derived his income from slave-grown slave -grown cotton. It's a good question, and one which with one with, yeah, I can't talk. It's a good question, and one with which I think Sam struggled. There is correspondence from prominent abolitionists urging him to become more public in his opposition to slavery. This Sam never did, apparently preferring to stay on the good side of his southern cotton suppliers. Yet he channeled large sums of money to the anti-slavery cause, largely through his brother, John Payson Williston, a Florence businessman and much more public abolitionist. While not immune to sharp business practice, Sam had little tolerance for shadiness in others. He had a long and stormy relationship with Charles Goodyear, who had discovered the process for vulcanizing rubber. Before Goodyear's success, he had tried to get Sam to finance a venture which Sam dismissed as a get-rich-quick scheme. In 1848, Sam, sought a Sam, who had repeatedly turned Goodyear down, sought a reliable supply of rubber for a new elastic suspender factory. And someone suggested that he go after Goodyear. Well, Williston exploded. Go after Goodyear? No difficulty in that. To get away from him is real trouble. If he hears of, a, of an old lady with $10 tucked away in a broken teapot, Goodyear will go after it. As Sam aged and his fortune grew, so did his ego. Emily, who was born with a greater portion of common sense, acted somewhat as a check on this. But Samuel's investment wizardry had never failed him. He was so confident that he took risks that occasionally scared his business partners. If he had a project to finance, whether it was a new mill or a charitable venture, he might strip one of his companies of nearly all its cash or borrowed he borrow heavily from the bank. That's what banks are for, he once said, conveniently neglecting to add that he owned the bank and was moving money from one pocket to the other. 
The greater the amount needed, the more likely it was to get his attention, especially if it was for charity. One of his adopted children recalled that if a supplicant was naive enough to ask for a small contribution, Sam would put on his best farm boy expression and mumble, I ain't got that kind of money. On the other hand, in 1864, the Reverend John Holbrook was in New England seeking to raise $30,000 to endow newly founded Grinnell College in Iowa. Holbrook told Williston's friend Samuel Seeley, the pastor of the Payson Church, that he hoped Williston would consider giving 1000 Don't bother, said Seeley. He won't even listen. Holbrook's face fell. No, no, you misunderstand me, Seeley protested. He'll just ignore a small request. Ask for the, thir ask for the full 30000 Holbrook got all of it. A year later, a, a year earlier, rather, Salmon told Headmaster Marshall Henshaw that he was discouraged that his scientific academy was not developing as fast as he'd hoped. The actual expression Sam used was, I've often wished the whole thing at the bottom of the sea. I once had that printed on a t-shirt. <laughs> Sam intended to cut his losses and close Williston Seminary. But Henshaw knew his man, asked for the moon and the stars, and came away with salaries for three new teachers and a science lab that rivaled Harvard's. In a 1940 memoir, Samuel's grandson, who spent his childhood summers visiting the homestead, recalled a man of imposing presence, who in earlier years must have been notably handsome. I never heard him speak harshly, and I cannot recall that he ever rebuked or corrected me. His manner, however, was uniformly serious, if not solemn. That he had softer feelings than might have been guessed from his manner was indicated by his toleration of young children about the house, as well as by his habit of feeding daily with his own hands the family cat. Emily, the grandson wrote, was the embodiment of gracious dignity, a wise woman who was not afraid to smile. Sam incurred serious losses in the post-Civil War economic downturn. He made the one great mistake of his life about this time. His ego got ahead of his judgment, and he invested heavily in a cotton thread mill that was destined for failure. It was the only time in his life that he'd gone against Emily's advice. To his credit, he admitted it. By his own estimate, he lost 60% of his net worth. There's no, there, there's no real indication of how it affected him, except that the strain may have damaged his health. He consolidated his assets, revised his will, and set his sights forward once more. His last words in 1874 were, I think I'm going through safe. He was 79. He and Emily had been married for 52 years. She continued their good works, although she had little to do with the school. She took special interest in Mount Holyoke College and in the Helping Hand Society and in the East Hampton Public Library, which she founded and which is now named for her. Several writers who knew her have used the word serene to describe her last years. The end came in 1885, a month shy of her 89th year. Consider what she, had, she and Samuel had lived through. The rise from a post-colonial confederation to a true republic and world power. The industrial revolution, the invention of the railroad, the telegraph, and so much more, the expansion of the country westward across the continent, and perhaps most important of all, the end of the abomination of slavery and the cathartic co conflict that accompanied it. When the Willistons first visited England, they purchased a brooch with a reproduction of John Singleton Copley's painting of the episode from 1 Samuel 3, in which the boy Samuel was called into the service of the Lord. Emily wore the jewel in every painted and photographic portrait for the rest of her life. You can pass this. That idea of serving the Lord was central to her psyche. Even more telling is this. One day in 1877, Emily and Williston Principal James Whiten were riding to South Hadley for a Mount Holyoke College commencement. 
Emily, in a reflective mood, said to Whiten, I thank God for the opportunity to do my part in a time of colossal change. I thank God for the opportunity to do my part. I think that, above all else, sums up Emily and Samuel Williston. And remember that I mentioned that Sam had ruined his eyesight at Andover in part, of an in, in part because of an in inadequate lamp? This is that very lamp. You might wonder how on earth we still have it. Well, you know how you save stuff? Samuel Williston kept this on his desk throughout his working life. My guess is that it was a reminder of where he'd started and how far he'd come. If you'd like to know more about the Willistons, I recommend Frank Conant's biography, God Stewards. It's here in Emily's library. Thank you. I would be thank you. more than happy to take questions. I got a couple of things, other things to pass here. Um, I just think this is you know, thrilling, because I remember Emily the legend with, you know, cutting up the black silk dress and making handmade buttons. A number of years ago, we were doing some renovation work in the Williston Parsonage, what they call the birthplace. It's now the residence of our academic dean, of our campus dean. Um, and we took up some floorboards in the kitchen and turned up a little tin box with a rusty pair of scissors um, some wooden button centers and some cir circles of black silk cloth. I can't guarantee that they're Emily's, but you know it's about right, and they date from the right time because once the button business had moved to a factory for mechanized buttons, there was no reason to make these anymore. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, and I've also got a, a sampler of Williston and Knight Company buttons. Here's some of the fancy buttons. You notice most of them are black. Uh, it, it took him a long time to get over that. Uh, it really did. Um, and you can see there, there are four here that are pasted on upside down, so you can see how they're, they're stamped into a metal center. Um, any questions? Any comments? Otherwise, we have cake. You, you mentioned <laughs> his uh, 